Good morning and welcome. Um, we're so glad you could join us here, whether you're here at Cross Point or join, joining us online, wherever you may be today. Um, you may be wondering why I'm up here today and not Pastor Rich. Um, basically, some of you, most of you should have gotten an email, but uh, Pastor Rich and his family and some of the praise team um, have been affected by COVID. Um, so out of an abundance of caution, uh, Pastor Rich decided to not come in today and just uh, be safe and same as some of the praise team. Um, so I'll be leading the service today. Um, and Jim Visser has graciously agreed to play all our songs for us. All our songs will be from the hymnal book. Um, you should have gotten an email this week that uh, had the numbers and the songs in them. Um, if you're not here, and we'll, we'll read them out to you, the numbers and that, uh, so you know where to look up and you can join us in worship. Um, so God's greeting today, and would you please stand with me? The grace of Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all you. Amen. And would you just take a moment to greet one another? Our call to worship today is from Psalm 89, verse 1 to 4. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my, milk, with my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. And let us begin our, our worship today by turning to song number 557, My Jesus, I Love Thee. That's song 557, My Jesus, I Love Thee.
God's will for our lives is best summarized in God's good law found in Deuteronomy 6, 4, verse 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command to you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and you shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Would you join me in a prayer of confession? Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we've been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name, through Christ our Lord, amen. Our assurance of pardon is from Psalm 103, verse 11 to 13. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As the Father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Our song of thanksgiving is song number 473, To God Be the Glory. That's song 473, To God Be the Glory.
Good morning, everybody. It's my privilege to uh, give the announcement for the offerings this morning. The first offering, of course, is for Cross Point Ministries. And as you know, that's uh, for all the stuff that goes on in this church uh, during the week. It's a busy church. And uh, we're just grateful that we can do the th those things. And that's the first offering. Uh, the second offering this morning is for Refugee, resp refugee Response. Our church is in the process of sponsoring um, two family units. Um, they're from Africa, and um, it's a complicated process. We know who they are. Uh, they're related to a member of this church, but the vetting process is, uh, takes a long time. And um, we're looking still at a two-year horizon for that. So it's not coming soon, but we've got to keep, be vigilant because it's going to happen and we have to be prepared. So that's the second offering for today. Uh, the offering for next week, I'm not quite sure what it is, but I'm sure it's going to be a good one. <laughs> Sorry about that, I didn't have time, time to look it up. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that uh, we can uh, come to this um, place of worship this morning and we can uh, also as part of that worship be able to give uh, our tithes and offerings to you. Lord we um, lift up the ministries in this church and Lord we pray for uh, our refugees that we have names for we have never met and we're just waiting for your timing for them to be able to begin the process of, of um, moving to Canada. We thank you for that opportunity and uh, we just pray for the larger worldwide uh, group of refugees that are displaced and living in places where they really are in transition. And Lord, we pray for uh, long-term placements for them as well. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Our song of preparation is song number 588, Tell Your Children. And with
And I'd like to call up the kids for Sunday school. If you are age three to grade two, if you could please come up here. Thank you. So this is the Christ candle, and I'll make it to you again. You can carry it to the Sunday school class. So it's just a reminder that uh, God's presence, that Jesus is with us, and he's the light of our path that shows us which way we should go. So just let me pray for the Sunday school lesson and uh, the sermon this morning. Thank you, God, that you are a loving and gracious God. Thank you that your love is perfect, it never fails, and that nothing can separate us from your love. We pray that our lives would be filled and overflowing with the power of your love, so we can make a difference in this world and bring honor to you. We ask you for your help in reminding us the most important things are not that what we do outwardly. It's not based on our talents or gifts, but the significance we can do in loving you and loving others. And Lord, we just uh, pray for the Sunday school teachers, Nancy, today, as she, she leads them in their lesson, that uh, they grow in knowledge of you, Lord. And I just uh, pray for the sermon that you've put on my heart, um, that we will listen with open ears and eyes. And we pray these things in Lord Jesus' great, great name. Amen. All right, Gifty, can you lead them out? Thank you. Um, before I start bringing God's word to us today, um, as most of you know, this was kind of a, a late addition for me be, to be up here today. Um, and what I did was I went to the CRNC NA website, and on there they have a link that you can look at, uh, at uh, approved sermons or sermons that have been preached before. So I looked at about 20 different ones, and the sermon that uh, I will be preaching today was the one that spoke the most to me. Um, and in it, I'll just, uh, I'll let you see what I'm talking about, but it just made me think about how I love as a husband and a father, and you know, how, how you love or how I love or how we should love the youth as well. Um, and it kind of convicted me when we were at Serve last week, um, the group that I was on, um, Brandon Lewis was the only one from Cross Point on it. And two days, we, two days, two different days, we were outside painting four, a big block of portables, there was four of them, and each day it was above 33 degrees. So the first day was very challenging, and our last day, the Friday, we had to go finish these portables up. Um, on our last day, going into it, we had one of the girls in my group broke her foot, so we were short one person. Someone else sprained the wrist at our fun day and another teenager had sunstroke. So we were very challenged to get this job done. Um, and it was Friday and a lot of the teams just lost their motivation. So it was, a, it was a challenging day. So our scripture today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 31 to verse thir 13 to three. First Corinthians 12, 31 to 13, three. And just before I start reading here, I just want to bring to our attention that the love or the word Paul uses for love here is called, the Greek word is agape for love. Um, and I'll just give us a quick description what it is um, that we can uh, just contemplate what this love Paul's talking about. It's a love that loves without changing. It's a self-giving love that gives without demanding or expecting payment. It's a love so great that it can give, be given to the unlovable. It's a love that loves even when rejected. It's a sacrificial love and it has little to do with emotions. It's a love for the sake of someone else. It's a love that isn't about me, it's about you. So 1 Corinthians 12, 31. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still more an excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, 
but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging, clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. This is the word of the Lord. The sermon was originally preached by Reverend Richard DeLang of Edmonton, Alberta. And I hope it serves us well today. Um, I've edited some things and added some things to make it more applicable for us today. So when we think about raising godly children and Christ-loving children, the first word that should come to mind is love. The primary ingredient that goes into loving and raising children is love. So what better place to look at the Bible's famous love chapter than 1 Corinthians 13. This chapter is written to a church about relationships in the church. Corinth was a congregation divided by all kinds of issues. Some liked one preacher better than another. Some acted like they were spiritually superior to others because they spoke in tongues. Some considered themselves better than others because they had great knowledge or faith than others. And all throughout history, those kinds of problems resurface in the churches in one form or another. And it's not a big leap from speaking about a church family to addressing one home within the larger body. Each family has some of the same dynamics that you find at work for good or bad in the church family. So let's look at the Lord's call to love. And clearly this is the most important ingredient in any relationship and certainly includes relationships at home. You can't miss the fact that the closing verse in chapter 13, verse 13 of our chapter today is that now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. God's love must be modeled in our homes, God ordained homes to be the basic building block of society. When love is lacking in the home, the family falls apart. And when the family falls apart, society falls apart. As Christians then, we have a high calling to build strong homes for the good of our children, for the good of society, and for the glory of God who calls us to do this. And it's not just calling the Christian parents to do this, but the entire covenant community which vows at the baptism of our children to do our part in helping the children to know the love of Christ and to live for him. So turning in our text today to 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3, we find three, five things which people might try to equate to love, but which all by themselves will not build a strong home. Love is the primary ingredient in building a strong family, but we learn in reading that love is more important than certain things that we sometimes try to pass off as love. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1 says, If I speak in tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. Paul was addressing the matter of speaking in tongues. Some in the church that claim their ability to speak in a different language, possibly a heavenly language, made them better Christians. Paul quickly reminds these people that all the words of earth or from heaven are just a bunch of noise without love. In our families, we can do a lot of talking. We can make a lot of noise, but are our words spoken in love? Oh, when the baby is first born, we speak with nothing but love in our hearts. We hold that little one close and tell her how beautiful she is. We tell our son we can't wait to get him home and how we're looking forward to playing sports with him. We tell her we're excited about having a little girl we can dress up and talk to. But before the child is one, or certainly three, our words may not have love in mind. When our child pulls out all our groceries out of the cupboard for the 10th time in a week, mom grows more frustrated and shouts, I thought I told you not to do that ever again. And what, what does daddy do? 
when the kid is being toilet trained and Keem seems to poop her pants time and time again? Are those words spoken in love? When our children enter the challenging but exciting phase of being a teenager, love calls us to be patient and to try to understand what it's like to be stuck in a cocoon, not really a caterpillar, but not a butterfly, sandwiched between childhood and adulthood, fighting for their wings of independence. But our words can often ignore that reality and simply address the troublesome youth. We might say, why don't you just zip it? Why do you dress that way? I said no, and that's the end of it. Are those kinds of statements spoken in love? And likewise, when our kids move out of the house and begin to live lives as singles or married adults. Parents, we must always ask, themselves, ask ourselves if we talk in love and communicate in love with them. Do our words build them up or tear them down? Jesus had this balance figured out. Remember how he spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well. He had nothing to gain. He spoke to the Samaritan woman in love. He showed true love for her condition. He entered her broken world and did not condemn her for everything she did like everyone else. In establishing a good relationship with her, he tells her to leave her life of sin. He, his talk there and elsewhere was filled with love for her and other sinners, people just like our children and us. Second, is love more important than knowledge? Yes, love is more important than the knowledge. And again, the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthians in verse two, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can know all mysteries and all knowledge, but not have not love, I am nothing. Here is someone who's disrupting the church because he supposedly has greater insight into the things of God than anyone else. That's his spiritual gift. But even if that's true, Paul says it's nothing because he doesn't use his knowledge lovingly. And that is also the danger in the family. As parents and other adults in the covenant family, we very likely know a lot more about things than our kids and youth. But it's important to remember that being smarter doesn't automatically increase your capacity to love. You might know a lot of things and you might be a really smart person, but you may not be a nice person to be around. This person uses his knowledge to make you inferior. He or she tries to impress you with their intelligence, shooting all kinds of facts at you. Maybe when discussing something, anything, they may have a smirk on their face and they say, you didn't know that, or I could have told you that. Those kind of comments don't warm you up to that person. And at the same time, we might know people who are not at the top of the class in terms of knowledge, but they know how to show genuine love. We see in the Lord how to love our children while having superior knowledge. After all, no one on earth or in heaven knows more than the Lord, and no one on earth or heaven loves like the Lord. Our Father in heaven looks at us every day, his children, and he knows us perfectly. He knows our strengths, but he also knows the sins we try to hide. And despite his perfect knowledge of us, sins and all, he loves his children. His desire is not that simply we become more knowledgeable. You may think, focus on thinking that knowledge will open every door of opportunity for your kids. You may send your child to a really good school. You may encourage them to get really good grades and earn scholarships for prestigious universities. But without love, it amounts to nothing. Instead, knowledge must enhance love. It must help us see ourselves as we truly are, not as someone greater than anyone else. Our knowledge of children's strengths and weakness must help us love them more love them better. Much like the Father's perfect knowledge of us moves him to love us so much that he gives us what we need in Christ. He knows our true condition and our desperate need for redemption. 
Even though we bring nothing to the relationship, he loves us perfectly. And precisely because of that, being loved by him creates a desire within us to please him. Doesn't it? Yes, indeed, it should. And it will do the same for the children in your family and in the covenant community. So use your knowledge to love better. Number three, love is more than faith. In the second half of verse two, Paul says, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. From time to time, a church will see a family struggle with the faith of one another. There may be a Christian woman married to a non-Christian man who's not a strong Christian. She may be very sincere about her faith. She may have seen the Lord do great and amazing things in her life. She may have many, many wonderful testimonies of God's answers to prayer. But in her zeal to make her husband grow in his faith, he only hears nagging that he should have faith like hers. So rather than the husband feeling love, feeling loved by her, he feels like she looks down on him and he backs away from God even more. Instead of being attracted to Christ by her strong faith, she turns him away. And parents, we can do the same thing with our children. Therefore, it's important for adults to understand that we can't force feed faith to people, especially to our kids, and faith can't exist by itself. It must be rooted in love and express itself in love. Our children watch to see that our faith is genuine and they measure the sincerity of our faith by the way we treat others and them. We can say all the right things about God, giving this atmosphere of having a great faith and a love for Christ, but our children watch to see if our faith translates into love towards them and others. Our children watch us and our attitude when we go to church. They see how we react to the sermon and the worship music. Number four, love is more than compassion. Paul writes in verse three, if I give all my possessions to the poor, but have not love, I gain nothing. Compassion is often equated with love, but here's a clear distinction Paul's making here. Just because you do a good thing, like helping the poor, or any worthy social cause, it doesn't mean you do it in love. Paul seems to be addressing those with the gift of giving, but the danger in this becomes like Annas and Sapphira in the early New Testament church. They did give generously, but they were motivated by selfish ambition. They wanted the people to think that they were really great Christians. Love for the poor was not their real motivation or intention. As Christian parents, we need to make sure that we are genuine because kids are the masters at detecting fakeness. And giving is a wonderful expression of love. But you can't buy the love of your children that the way Annas and Sapphira tried to buy the respect of the church. All too often in today's wealthy and materialistic society, Some parents try to buy the love of their kids by getting them things that they want. That may be nice, but is love their motivation? I saw an episode of Dr. Phil where a 13-year-old boy was so spoiled by his parents that they let him pick out his mom's car. It was some kind of convertible of sports car, of course, and they even let him drive it before he had a driver's license. And the dad finally admitted that spoiling the kid was a cover-up for not spending enough time with him. So on the outside, there was appearance of generosity, but there was not a willingness to do what it takes to truly show love to a child. As a result, the kid was literally spoiled rotten. He kept wanting more and more from his parents to fill that void in his life. He needed love, just spending time with him, and not more lavish gifts, which others might perceive, as very compassionate or generous. And finally, this morning, the last point is we see that love is far more than sacrifice. We read in verse three, Paul says, if I surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. 
No one will deny that sacrifice to the degree that Paul speaks of here can be the supreme indication of love. It's Jesus himself who says, in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And he followed through with laying down his life for us. But Paul's point is that sometimes even big sacrifices on the outside can be made without love, and therefore they are nothing. Similar to the father who tries to buy his child's affection, these are parents who deceive themselves into thinking that sacrifice is more than important than love. Mom and dad work long, long hours, and they neglect nurturing their children. But the whole time they convince themselves that they are sacrificing time at home for the good of the family. They say to their kids, do you not realize what I'm doing is for you to give you a better future and success in this world? I suspect many parents do that, but the kids never really understand that a dad and mom love them because they never spend time with them. They're always too busy for their own children and it's important to remember that Jesus is never too busy for us. In his sacrifice for us, it's clear that the love for God, the love for his own children, drove him to the cross. Philippians 2, verse 6 to 8, reminds us that Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. His love for us led him to sacrifice his glory in order to dwell with us. John says the word became flesh and he made his dwelling with us. His sacrifice was coming to just be with us, to live among us, to join us in our sorrows and joys so that he could show us the full extent of his love when he died on the cross. His sacrifice was not a cover-up to get more things for himself. It was to bless us for now and eternity because he loves us. So the bottom line with each of these three things, talk, knowledge, faith, compassion, and sacrifice, is to be brutally honest with yourself before God. Parenting has great rewards, but it can be hard work. It isn't for the weak. And being part of the covenant community isn't for the weak either. It's a great privilege and responsibility God has given us. It's a high calling by placing children in our care, who we must generally love in order to help them become the best citizens of God's kingdom they can be. So as brothers and sisters in Christ, we must take stock of our lives and ask hard questions sometimes. Maybe discuss these questions with your spouse, or maybe even later your children, or with a member of the church. Question one, am I talking with kids or just talking at them? Is my knowledge, number two, is my knowledge assisting me in showing Christ-like love to the children, or am I making them feel like they don't belong? Number three, does my compassion and generosity flow freely to my family and to others out of a love for Christ? Or is it just another way of making others, others think I'm a wonderful person? And lastly, and do my sacrifices really help my family and loved ones know that I love them? You see, the call to love is a great one. And we don't all have the same spiritual gifts and or physical abilities, but God has given us all the capacity to love as Christians because Christ first loved us. In word and deed, we can point our children to the source of love, Jesus Christ, and our Lord will supply us with the love we need to do the wonderful and challenging work of raising covenant children. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have shown us the full extent of love, giving your Son to be our Savior. Lord Jesus, you sacrificed your glory and your life on earth in order to show us the depths of your love. Help us to love our children as we ought to, 
Teach us to evaluate our lives and make the necessary changes by the power of the Holy Spirit to help our families and our church families to know our love and yours more fully. Amen. Our song of response is song number 586 in our household's Heavenly Father. That was song number 586 in our household's Heavenly Father. And would you please stand? may be seated. Um, Would you join me in a prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you that you're a loving and gracious God. Thank you that you offered us forgiveness and the gift of new life in you. Thank you that your love is perfect. It never fails and nothing can separate us for your love. We pray that our lives would be overflowing with the power of your love so we can make a difference in this world and bring honor and glory to you. Lord, thank you that your love is patient and help us show patience with those around us. Lord, thank you that your love is kind and help us extend kindness to others. Lord, thank you that you show us that true love is not jealous, helping us casting aside feelings of jealousy and hatred towards others. And Lord, there is so much hate in the world. Please give us a new heart. We pray for the persecuted church in Pakistan. We pray for Ashik, who's been sentenced to death for believing in the Lord Jesus for salvation. We ask that you give wisdom and knowledge to his legal counsel. We ask that your presence, peace, and love be with his wife and daughter. We pray for health and peace and comfort for Pastor Rich and Margaret and other members of the praise team that are being affected by COVID. And we look forward to seeing them soon. We thank you for amazing serve experience for our teens. We thank you for safe travels and new friendships made. We thank you for Heather for filling in for Janet this week in the office. And Holy Spirit, be with all our friends and family as we travel and visit people that we've not been able to visit for a long time. And we're so thankful we can visit them and give us safe travels there and back. May we cherish the hugs and smile in all these God moments. And may we remember how good you are, Father. Refresh us and restore us. In Jesus' loving and victorious, glorious glorious name we pray. Amen. Um, Would you please stand as we have our closing blessing. May the love of the Father hold us with the wisdom of the Son enlighten us, the fire of the Holy Spirit kindle us, and may the blessings of the Lord come down upon us 
and remain with us. Amen. Our final song, our parting song of praise is number 632, To God Be the Glory. That's 632, To God Be the Glory.